Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today I have with me Michael Bradford. Uh, Michael Bradford has been involved in research on Kundalini and consciousness for more than 40 years. In 1977, he traveled to India where he spent six years as a volunteer worker for the Central Institute for Kundalini Research, founded and directed by the late Pandit Gopi Krishna. Michael has been a board member of the Institute for Consciousness Research since it was founded and has been director of publications during this time. In 2015, he became a board member of the Emerging Sciences Foundation and is currently acting as an advisor to the ESF's Kundalini Experimental Project. Uh, so Mike, your book, uh, Consciousness, The New Paradigm, which I, I have here, uh, tackles some of the biggest and most important questions about life, uh, its origin, where the universe came from, uh, where is evolution leading us, and what is consciousness. Uh, and I like this book because it feels like it's written for the non-scientist who wants to understand you know, the limits of modern science and where the science of the future might lead us. So Michael Bradford just wanted to thank you for being here with us today. Well, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, for having me. And I would like to thank uh, the ESF for uh, all the work you're doing and for uh, for hosting me today. So, uh, yeah, the book um, really came together as a consequence of me writing three separate articles for the uh, Institute for Consciousness Research newsletter. And I had the idea a little while ago of combining them all together into one uh, single work. The problem I had was they were dealing with different subjects, some with life, some with the origin of creation, some with psychic phenomena. And I thought, how can I possibly tie all these together? And then it came to me that uh, the best way to approach this would be to present a number of questions which are very important for most of us. Uh, you know, where do we come from? You know, I mean, some people aren't so much concerned with the origin of the universe, but you know, a lot of people have uh, some of these questions in their mind. And I thought, well, if I pose all these questions and then I look at them in terms of considering reality to be consciousness rather than physical matter, and then to see where that, uh, where that leads. And so that's how it started out. Um, you know, I, I put down all these questions and then I looked at uh, the Indian spiritual tradition because uh, that is where I've had the most um, uh, interest and in study in, in the last 40 or so years. And because the Indian spiritual tradition, it's, it's taken for a given, in, no matter which part of that tradition you look at, that consciousness is the primary reality. And then uh, after that, uh, I focused in on Kundalini because Kundalini is really the lever which uh, will enable the human species uh, to evolve to the point where it can perceive consciousness directly uh, rather than, uh, you know, we perceive matter right now, that's all. But this new faculty of perception that seems to be evolving in the race uh, will give us a direct apperception of consciousness uh, in its true form. And so once I had that kind of defined, I talked about the Kundalini process a little bit and some of the various aspects of it. And then I started looking at the various questions. And uh, the one that I spent the most time on was life, because life is still a profound mystery. And uh, science, uh, although it has made tremendous strides in the last 50 or 60 years, uh, ever since the discovery of DNA, of understanding life, there are still so many questions about it that science cannot answer, even still. And so uh, I got into studying genetic research just because I started asking questions and I, well, I got to find out how that works. And I was absolutely amazed at uh, what I saw. Uh, one of the things that really triggered the book was in, I think it was July of 2012. And I saw a graphic animation of DNA being replicated. And I was absolutely floored. Uh, it's this, these micro uh, miniature machines that are just uh, splitting the DNA and they're whirling loops and they're combining it. And I looked at this and I was absolutely astounded. I thought, this is the work of consciousness at the micro miniature level. And then when I started studying it, I, I there was just one question after the other uh, that came out because science is, is um, become very knowledgeable in 
what these processes are doing. And if you do this to this process or if you take it with it like that, then the result will be this. Uh, but in terms of what is driving all these processes, they are so complex, so dynamic. They're not like a, they're not like linear processes. They're dynamic. One thing happens, it does this. A different thing happens, it does that. And they are blindingly fast, unbelievably fast in the way they work. And I just started asking questions and then question after question after question. Well, what controls this? What determines that? How does this thing get initiated? And uh, it was an absolutely wonderful experience to, uh, you know, to go in and, and, and look at uh, the way life works at a very basic level. Uh, some of the other aspects of life I looked at were the origin of life, because um, as far as evolution goes, uh, science is pretty much fixated on the Darwinian view of things. However, the Darwinian view is only applicable in the case of a replicating life form. Before self-replication, uh, the Darwinian hypothesis has no meaning because you have to have replication. So then I started looking at how how amino acids were formed, and how proteins were formed from amino acids, and how other things and all that, are, and cells. And uh, it was really, uh, truly uh, an incredible learning experience for me. And in the book, I've tried to keep it uh, in balance in the sense that I didn't want to overwhelm people too much with the technicalities. And to be honest, I'm not a geneticist myself, but I also wanted to convey enough of the book, uh, the details of it, so that. Um, uh, you know, people could get a really clear idea of how, I, I guess the only term I could think of is miraculous life is. Uh, it, it literally is miraculous. And, you know, I looked at some of the other aspects of life, um, uh, in particular DNA and the role played by DNA. And this is one thing that uh, really became evident to me after a while is that many people look at DNA, it, it, it does just about everything. It, it builds the body. I mean, it ties your shoelaces. It's, it's like everywhere you turn, people are saying, well, oh, it's a genetic thing. Uh, and yet when I look at DNA to see what actually did, I was quite amazed because uh, even though DNA is totally essential in the sense of how cells are constructed and how they function, uh, there is, seems to be nothing in the DNA that has um, an actual blueprint for the human body. If you were to ask a geneticist, where in the DNA does it says that we have two hands, two feet, one nose, that the head is on top of the body? Or if you ask them, well, what controls the sequence of events that builds the eye? They have no answer. That information, from what we know, is simply not in DNA at all. And so uh, I look back at the Indian spiritual tradition, and they talk about this uh, incredibly uh, super intelligent life energy that controls all these processes. And uh, to me, there was the answer that uh, uh, in terms of how uh, life is created in the sense of how the, the uh, fetus is built in the womb, the only explanation that makes any sense is this super intelligent prana, this, uh, this uh, controlling life principle. So I had lots of fun with life, and then I went on to some of the other uh, questions. Um, uh, the origin of the universe, uh, and that was one of, to me, one of the most interesting questions because, um, <laughs> as as I, I remarked at the beginning of the book, the actual existence of the universe is a total contradiction to the intellect. It, it, it's really when the intellect tries to grasp where the universe came from, it can't, because no matter what sort of cause you attribute to the universe, well. It comes from the Big Bang, it, it comes from a deity, uh, it comes from a, a spontaneous creation of the void. No matter what you consider to be the genesis of the universe, you can always go and say, well, what brought that into being? And it just came down to the point where I, my, I, I had this almost shocking, uh, I guess it's like a, a Zen koan. It's like, why is there anything? Because to me, uh, it would make far more sense if there was nothing. No universe, no creation, no nothing, because nothing would require nothing to create it. So, you know, to me, that was one of the more interesting questions. Uh, some of the other things I looked at in the book were um, uh, psychic ability, psychic phenomena. You know, science has been studying psychic phenomena for something like 200 years, very intensely. And yet they still are virtually no clearer or no closer to understanding 
what causes them than they were 200 years ago. Uh, I mean, they've done a lot to study them in some ways and how they work and even just the basic um, principle of validating that they exist. I mean, they're statistically so significant that they cannot be denied. But in terms of what causes them, uh, they still have no idea. Uh, another element that I look at of the book is instinct in animals and um, how plants grow. And again, there is simply no explanation for science. And uh, science tends to use the word instinct as kind of like a, uh, a reason. <laughs> it's like they define this term instinct. And when something happens that they have no explanation for, they just, oh, it's instinct. And yet, where is instinct? What is it? Where does it come from? Um, I was watching a TV program a couple of weeks ago about animal behavior, and this woman was talking about how I can't remember what animal it was, but it had uh, evil without the guidance of its parents. It still knew what to do in terms of feeding itself and hunting and all that. And she said, oh, it's genetic. And I thought, well, how do the genes control instinct? There's no linkage whatsoever. And yet people look at both uh, genes, the genetic code, and instinct, kind of like fait accompli. They're, you know, this is where they come from, but there's no explanation for them. And uh, another question that I, I really found interesting was this whole question of why there are laws in the universe and why mathematics is so incredible in terms of describing the physical creation. And this has been a puzzle for mathematicians going right back to the time of Plato. And uh, to me, uh, you know, there is no answer from the point of view of science why something that is a thought, like a concept in our thinking, is actually a physical law at the same time. Uh, they have no explanation. And um, some of the more, one of the more modern uh, mathematicians, Max Tietmark, uh, has come, he's been so bold as to say, well, uh, the universe is a mathematical object. And I thought, well, you're getting in the right direction, but you're not going far enough. Uh, you have to look at mathematics as an aspect of the universal consciousness. And then uh, universal consciousness projects first mind and then matter. So it projects these laws, uh, these mathematical uh, mathematical uh, um, uh, laws through first mind and then consciousness into physical matter. So... You know, uh, that was another one to me that uh, I found really fascinating. And there were some other things that I, you know, I looked at, uh, you know, some other more interesting questions. But for the most part, uh, that's a, a general synopsis of the book. And at the end of the book, what I did was I tried to uh, look at things in terms of evolution, because um, many people who uh, will be watching this uh, broadcast uh, are people who have had some kind of uh, Kundalini experience. And for them, it's uh, it's been very difficult for most people in this situation to explain to someone, uh, be they a scientist or just a lay person, what it is that's going on in them, because it doesn't make any sense. It, it makes no sense from uh, a scientific perspective that there's this funny snake-like thing at the base of your spine doing these things. And uh, it just uh, is very difficult to convey so what I was, what I tried to do at the end of the book was to look at Kundalini in terms of evolution, which is the way Gopi Krishna presented it, and to look at Kundalini as the mechanism which is controlling evolution both in the individual and the species as a whole. And what it is trying to do is to enhance our perceptive faculties so that we will be able, in hopefully the not too distant future, to perceive consciousness in a more direct way. And uh, what we see with people having Kundalini experiences is that depending on how, uh, you know, what the physiological aspects of it are in the body, it has different effects. Some people have psychic abilities. Uh, some people have uh, mystical experiences. And so um, we're looking at Kundalini in that sense as uh, the explanation for uh, this new uh, step in human evolution. And certainly, uh, that was a whole topic in itself. You know, uh, if I talk in the book about evolution and the resistance that science has had, uh, to entertaining any kind of thought that consciousness has a reality unto itself, uh, despite, you know, evidence, uh, to indicate that it is. 
And uh, so that's the general gist of the book. And uh, uh, I guess, uh, I guess what what really uh, for me was important in writing the book was to convey to people that that it's imperative that we recognize this evolutionary process in the race that's going on that we're evolving to uh, what Kofi Krishna called a predetermined goal that uh, we're evolving to a new uh, faculty of consciousness which is sort of like another step beyond the intellect in the same way the intellect is beyond basic animal consciousness but this is a predetermined goal and we have to cooperate with that process and if we don't cooperate uh, then the consequences are dire for the species that um, uh, if we do not recognize these evolutionary processes and do what we can to facilitate them rather than to hinder them, then uh, I don't see a future for the human race. It's that serious. So uh, the whole book, in a way, is oriented towards uh, presenting this idea of uh, the next step in human evolution so that um, people can get a grasp of how important Kundalini is, because Kundalini is, as Gopi Krishna called it, the guardian of human evolution. It's what drives it, it's what controls it. And uh, even at one point in the book, I, I showed how consciousness can actually affect the way that DNA is replicated uh, so, it, in, so that it could modify the genetic code uh, as it's being replicated. So, so that's um, sort of a general overview of the book. And, um, uh, you know, I hope that I've, uh, I've conveyed things in a way that is understandable for people and, and you know, not gotten too, uh, too technical in, in what I've said. And, and at the same time, I'm really trying to appeal to the scientific community to say, hey, uh, this is a valid phenomenon, Kundalini, which must be looked at. It, it's absolutely essential uh, that we examine the Kundalini process to understand what it is and what it's doing. So, uh, so anyway, that's a general synopsis of the book, and uh, uh, I, I guess you have some specific questions you wanted to ask me about it. Yeah, so that was definitely it's a lot of information to unpack, and um, there's there's even in the book. I mean, there's a lot, covers so many different topics, such a wide range of things. Um, I want to go back to the beginning of, mm -hmm. of the book where you you point out that there are many areas of science that the current scientific paradigm simply can't explain. Um, you know, things like dark matter or biological processes, as you mentioned. Um, but one of the things you point out is that it seems like the scientists of today are severely limiting themselves uh, to perhaps some of the greatest discoveries of the future, really not because they lack the tools or the intelligence per se, but because of deeply seated assumptions. Can you talk about kind of those, you know, the paradigm, the current paradigm, uh, maybe previous paradigms, where we're moving into, and then assumptions that are that are holding us back uh, as a as a civilization from moving into that next phase of discovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, people, a lot of people have a sort of a general idea that that religions are faith based, and that science is based on, on strict, uh, undeniable, provable fact. But that's not really the case, because if you start looking at the way science operates, it has a whole set of assumptions about the nature of reality, which basically is what a paradigm is, uh, which when you look at them, you can go, well, they really don't have any sort of proof of these things, because an assumption is an assumption. You can't prove it one way or the other. So, for instance, uh, one of the rules by which science uh, guides its own development is to say that unless something can be detected by our senses or our recording instruments, it doesn't exist. And it's kind of a puzzling attitude because if you look at the last 50 or 60 years, science has discovered two new forces of nature, uh, dark matter and dark energy, that they had no idea of before. And yet these are perfectly accepted uh, scientific phenomenon. So why science is not willing to entertain the idea that say, for instance, there's a medium behind life processes, some kind of intelligent medium in the universe, uh, maybe like dark en energy or dark matter, which is at the basis of life processes. And they just dismiss it out of hand. And they say, it's not possible, it can't happen. And so, you know, this is one of the assumptions that science is making, which in a way has, has kind of kept science honest over the years. And, and I can understand, you know, uh, why this has happened. 
The other thing to keep in mind is that virtually since its inception, science has been, uh, I guess you could say, in a struggle with religion uh, over, I guess, you know, who, what is the valid way to look at creation? And this struggle has uh, gone on for five, six hundred years now. And it's not something that is, is getting any better because in the last 50, 100 years, uh, fundamentalism uh, in some of the various faiths has been on the rise. And so science uh, feels that this attitude they have is that we have to deny anything that smacks of consciousness as an independent reality. We have to deny it outright. And they will fight tooth and nail against anything that 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 uh, goes in that direction. And to me, that's kind of like throwing up the baby with the bathwater. You know, they're rejecting uh, the idea of consciousness universally, even though they have no explanation for, for any some of these questions. So do you think that um, the rejection of religion, so I, my understanding is, you know, as a scientist, you're looking at the past 500, 1,000 years, and you look back to the Dark Ages, and you look back at the persecution of, of scientists, you know, by the Roman Catholic Church, and you, you think yeah. about that and you say, well, you know, we want to divorce ourselves from this idea of an intelligent creator behind the universe and remain strictly objective mm -hmm. and limit ourselves to things that, that we can measure, you know, directly, which makes sense from a scientific point of view. Um, but do you also, I mean, do you feel that there are maybe psychological even reasons that scientists might want to deny uh, or just outright, you know, avoid altogether this concept that there is an intelligence or a consciousness behind the universe, um, you know, ego or something like that. What's your, your sense there? Well, I, I, first of all, I'd like to make it clear that I have the highest regard for science, uh, specifically the true scientific attitude which is to be critical of everything, but to be accepting of all possibilities. And what we have now is uh, overemphasis on the critical side and an outright dismissal of other possibilities. And this is, science has an ego. <laughs> uh, if you look back at the history of science, it seems to be a very common thread that even as far back as say the beginning of the 20th century, there was this idea that we, we just about got it nailed down. You know, there's just a few questions left to answer. And there was a book uh, written towards, I guess it was in the late 1990s, uh, by a fellow named John Horgan, who was a, a senior uh, writer for Scientific American magazine. And the book, The End of Science, basically posited that we have just about answered all the questions there are to be answered. The war is almost over. There's just a bit of mopping up to do. And... <laughs> And yet, there are so many questions that science can't answer. And uh, to me, this attitude is, uh, it's really puzzling. And first of all, because of the fact that science doesn't have answers. And secondly, because time and time and time again, something that was accepted as scientific fact was demolished by a new discovery. It's just happened over and over and over and over again, time after time. And yet, uh, there is this attitude that, well, science is the king and, and this is our territory and we just about got it nailed down. And I don't mean to demean all scientists, of course. I'm here, here I'm talking about orthodox science, uh, the kind of attitude which if, say, a researcher at a university decides to take up something having to do with, say, consciousness research or psychic phenomenon, they may find that their grant money dries up and that nobody will hire them. Uh, it's it's a very uh, insidious kind of attitude within orthodox science to sort of stamp out these heretical ideas. And so there are, to me, I think science is as wonderful as it is. And, and uh, as I said, I have the highest regard for science. Science has given us uh, some areas of exploration, like in medicine, curing these terrible diseases, in cosmology, understanding how the creation absolutely amazing uh, the knowledge that science has given us and uh, to that I'm internally grateful but it's this sort of attitude of superiority which in a way 
uh, I don't know if the science, science would like to hear this, but the attitude that they have towards some of the things that we want to see research done is almost identical to the attitude that the church has had towards science. You're stepping on our territory. We know what's, you know, what God's word and, you know, to the gallows with you if you say different. So it's a very similar attitude. It's an entrenched kind of uh, attitude. And yet there are many scientists out there, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, you know, doing some absolutely marvelous work, uh, you know, writing some really incredible books on these subjects. So there are many scientists, and I think the system is slowly breaking down that this orthodox uh, uh, attitude is slowly uh, being whittled away by uh, more discerning scientists who are looking at uh, some of the discoveries that are being made uh, and going, well, you know, this is a valid thing for study here. You know, we cannot just rule it out as being because it doesn't fit in with our paradigm. Therefore, it's not possible. That doesn't work anymore. So, you know, this, this sort of gradual process of uh, science shifting and expanding is happening. But uh, I only hope it would happen a bit faster. <laughs> so I want to stay on that topic just for a little bit longer. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to read a few quotes out of your book to kind of drive home the point. Uh, this is uh, something in here about Lord Kelvin, uh, chairman sure. of the Royal Society. This is in 1895. And a quote from him says, uh, heavier than air flying machines are an impossibility. Mm -hmm. uh, you have another quote in here, 1894, from physicist Albert Michelson. He says, uh, the more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered. And these are now so firmly established that the possibility of their ever being supported being supplanted in consequence of new discoveries is exceedingly remote. Our future discoveries must be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. Uh, another one, uh, 1899, Charles H. Uh, uh, Duell, or Duell, commissioner of the US Patent Office, he says, everything that can be invented has been invented. Uh, and then here's a recent one from Ken Olson, founder of the Digital Equipment uh, Computer Corporation in 1977 stated, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. Now, when I was reading these, it sounded very similar to what you oftentimes hear from Orthodox religion. Uh, this, this book or this text has all the knowledge that you ever need to know about God, uh, faith, or spirituality in general, and you don't need to look anywhere else, and this is set in stone. Uh, can you talk about just some of the similarities when you're writing this book that you found between science and religion? And, and you know, I know that scientists like to, uh, you know, make it seem like that they're looking at things objectively and with an open mind. Um, but, you know, clearly that's not the case today, at least in, in you know, the fields of consciousness research and other areas. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, as far as faith goes, uh, and Again, I would like to make it clear that I have the highest regard for faith in a general sense. I, I think faith has been absolutely essential in guiding the human race uh, to a healthy, uh, like on a healthy path of evolution. And this is primarily by uh, the strictures that all faiths have. You know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, you should be honest, you should be charitable. You know, all these different um, guidelines for behavior. And these, this is really the core of all religious teaching. And that is what is the valuable thing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, where faith has uh, gone wrong, in my opinion, is that uh, I guess because there was this general idea that creation, I mean, a thousand, two thousand years ago, the creation was very small. You have to consider that most people, all they knew of was where they lived and maybe a few hundred miles around and there's the stars overhead. And the idea that uh, a kind of a magnified human being could manufacture this creation was quite plausible. But now that's not the case. We know that the universe is unimaginably vast. And so faith has not uh, altered its attitude as a consequence of the knowledge that we have gained in that area. And because of that, there is this general idea amongst most of the faiths, I would say, that the founders of the faiths, who I consider to be the true guiding lights of the race, the true enlightened beings, uh, you know, Christ, uh, Krishna, Buddha, uh, they regard these people as being 
just one step removed from, from divinity. Like they're, they're just like one little bit below divinity. But because of that, the attitude has been that whatever they said must have been uh, true because it's coming from the higher power. Uh, the error in that thinking is that even though the creator may be infinite, our ability to perceive the creator is not. We have to perceive the creator and whatever comes from the creator through our brain and our intellect. And, uh, and this is why all the faiths have a somewhat different idea of, of the way things are. So what it boils down to for me is in a nutshell, and this applies to both science and, and, and uh, faith, is that they look at the human being, the way the human being is now, as pretty much the finished product of evolution. That we are the acme of perfection. There is no possibility of anything beyond uh, the human intellect, the human mind. And because of that attitude, again, both faith and science have this attitude, they're limiting their scope of our understanding uh, by that very attitude. And I know if you said to, a, say, a biologist, well, uh, do you consider evolution to be finished? They would probably say, oh, no, 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 I don't think evolution is finished. But then if you said, well, could you describe to me the next stage in human evolution? They wouldn't be able to. And if you look at what they say, uh, what their ideas are, they're all based on this assumption that we are the finished product of evolution. So to me, uh, this is really... Um, the real reason that that our sort of knowledge into understanding these questions that I've been asking in the book uh, is basically stuck. Uh, it's just not going anywhere. So, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of my uh, approach. And uh, again, you know, uh, uh, I want to emphasize that both science and religion and faith uh, are hugely important in human development. And we need them both. You know, uh, there has to be... Um, I guess, a merging of the two in the future into what you might call a super science or a super faith or a super something <laughs> that takes in the both. In your book, you, you talked about paradigms. And um, I guess before we jump in there, can you kind of describe what a paradigm is before we start talking about, about them? Yeah, a paradigm is really a set of basic beliefs that we have about reality. And, uh, you know, we form these paradigms as we're growing up. You know, we're taught by our parents, we're taught by schools, we're taught by our own experience. And paradigms are absolutely essential uh, to our survival because uh, they, they're what we use as a standard to judge uh, the rightness or wrongness or the, the unhealthiness or healthiness or whatever of our actions or of other people's actions. So without a paradigm, we may... We're standing on top of a 50-story building. We say, oh, wouldn't it be the fun to jump off? Well, your paradigm tells you that's probably not a good idea. So paradigms are absolutely essential. But where the problem lies is that uh, very few people of any stripe, be they of faith or of science, are willing to really look at their assumptions. Because an assumption, they, they, they treat their assumptions as true, not as an assumption. And so in the book, I try to point out uh, these various assumptions that faith and science are both making, that uh, if you look at them, for instance, the assumption that science makes that um, unless we can detect it physically, it doesn't exist. That's an unprovable assumption. Uh, you know, so uh, we have to uh, go back and look at our assumptions in a very honest light. And this is, uh, as I said, something that's essential for both faith and science to do. And um, once you go back and look at the, the paradigm that you're following in a really critical light, then hopefully questions will start to come up. And it, I mean, it's important to look at why do I believe this? You may have a particular belief about something, but why do I believe this? Why do I believe that psychic phenomena don't exist? Is it because I truly believe they don't exist and they can't exist? Or is it because I'm going to lose my grant money if I say something to that effect? Uh, why do we have these assumptions uh, about things? And it, it, it's very insidious, too, because in science, um, the paradigm or the assumptions that a scientist has, they'll determine the experiments the scientist will do. 
They'll determine the way in which that experiment is performed. They'll determine the way the results are interpreted. So you, for instance, you may have a scientist who has a result which is contrary to their paradigm, and they'll just throw it out, they'll ignore it. Well, it, it can't be, it's not possible. I must have made a mistake. I, I must have done something wrong in the experiment, so I'm just gonna throw it out and ignore it. And so it, it really literally determines the whole way in which uh, scientific exploration is done. And again, it applies to faith as well. Uh, so many people uh, have the beliefs that come from their faith, but they're not willing to look at those beliefs in the light of the scientific knowledge we've gained in the last thousand years or so. So uh, paradigms are, are very, very important, but we have to have an awareness that we have a paradigm and, and to really uh, honestly uh, look at those beliefs. So in, in your book, you, you talked about the the existing scientific paradigm. And then you also talk about a new emerging paradigm that you'd like to see take shape you know, in the world of science. Um, can you talk about kind of that, that shift, what we, what we might see taking place? Yeah. Um, in terms of studying consciousness, there's a certain amount that science can do, and there's a certain amount that it cannot do um, with its current methods. So for instance, let's say in terms of validating Kundalini experience, which you know is very much a, a concern of, of the Emerging Sciences Foundation and, and probably many people who are listening today, uh, there are certain aspects of a major Kundalini awakening, which it should be uh, possible for science, even at its present stage uh, of development to, 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 to see, like for instance, um, the reversal of the reproductive system. You know, the reproductive system function is in a very different way for someone who is having a major Kundalini awakening. There's probably changes in the cerebral spinal fluid, uh, the development of traits of genius. These can be uh, detected or measured to some degree. So it really is possible uh, if we had the right kind of scientific uh, approach and investigation to verify that Kundalini is a biological process in the body. However, in terms of exploring consciousness itself, uh, the only um, the only avenue for that to happen is for the research researcher uh, to use their own consciousness to to study you know the universal consciousness. There, there's no other way it can be done. So there is, uh, as I said, you know, uh, a certain amount we can do, but then beyond that. But uh, as an, uh, another aspect of that is that the attitude of how we do the research is absolutely essential. Because here we're not dealing with an inert force of nature like electromagnetism or gravitation or even dark matter or whatever. We are dealing with an intelligence which is vastly superior to our own. And we cannot approach an investigation of that intelligence with any idea of exploitation, of dominance, of control. Because basically that's, you know, the scientific method, uh, when you combine it with the materialistic you know, way in which our society functions, these all enter into science. How can we exploit this? How can we use this to our advantage? How can we gain from it? How can we control it? And um, I pointed out towards the end of the book about uh, the ancient Vedic tradition. Uh, here's a classic example. In the ancient Vedic tradition, um, learning is regarded in a very different way than it is in the West today. Uh, in the West today, uh, we talk about learning uh, with a focus on ourselves as individuals. I have a degree in this. I have my master's in that. You know, I have a PhD in this. I am the expert. I'm the one who knows how things work. In the Vedic tradition, if you wish to study one of the, what they call the vidyas, the sort of the an aspect of consciousness that has to do with a particular branch of knowledge, uh, you know, of any kind, medicine, political science, or whatever. These are said to be vidyas, they are living intelligences. Uh, you cannot approach uh, a living intelligence with that kind of an attitude. So the way the Vedic tradition would say is, you have to study diligently for years and practice and practice and practice and learn and learn with an attitude of humility. 
And then if the video decides that you are a fit vehicle, the knowledge of that video will come through you. So the whole attitude that science has is, is also, in addition to its blindness, uh, its attitude uh, is holding it back from this kind of an explanation. And um, uh, this is uh, one of the most essential things in terms of how you know, our discoveries of consciousness go forward in the future uh, is the attitude that we take towards it. It's absolutely essential. It's a hard pill for science to swallow, but it's, you know, to me, it, it's just the way it is. And uh, eventually science uh, will have to accept it. And I just hope it is sooner rather than later. So I can, I can just hear a skeptical scientist you know, hearing all of this. And, uh, you know, the first thing that, that I think they would say is, well, you're, it seems like the request here is to study something outside the intellect, um, something that we can't measure. And so by definition, that's outside of the realm of science that's out in there in philosophy land. Uh, so what would you say to a scientist who, who has that viewpoint? Well, this is, uh, I guess, virtually the same attitude that held back religion and was the reason that science came into being. And uh, this, um, this attitude that we have reached the limits, you know, like we, we are the, um, uh, we know best what's going on here. And uh, I guess, I'm just trying to think of how I was going to express it. Um, this attitude of um, uh, superiority, you might say. And I think what, the difficulty is, is that both science and religion are not looking at the fact that everything in the universe evolves. Everything evolves except for consciousness. Consciousness is infinite. It is timeless. It is beyond time and space. Everything in the material universe evolves. Everything is born. Everything evolves and grows. Everything dies. And that applies to the whole creation. It applies to galaxies. It applies to stars, the planets. To human beings, to every form of life on the earth, every aspect of our of our society, our political, social, education systems, they all have to change and evolve and grow. And what faith, because of the attitude that faith had, the word of God is final. The words that are written in this book are final. They are indisputable. It was this this attitude that we we cannot go any further and. We, we, the rest of the universe has to evolve, but we don't. And this is kind of the way science is, that they're looking at themselves as uh, this is the way we are now, and it, it can't change. And it's, a, it's contrary to really a universal law of nature. Everything has to evolve, to grow, to change, uh, to become better. And that's what I would say to a scientist. And uh, uh, they may not like it, but that's, you know... <laughs> That's, yeah, uh, one of the other things that you had mentioned in the um, in the book was you, know, you called out the processes that that happen with DNA and and replication and other things. Um, and in the book, a lot of those processes are attributed to this intelligent energy that goes by various names, uh, Kundalini being one of them. But you know, I I can also hear a, a scientist saying also, you know. We, we just need to learn more about how DNA works. Uh, we just need to understand the complete mechanisms. Maybe there's something that we're leaving out of our, our, our examination. And, but once we find it, once we find these, uh, you know, the mechanism behind this, then we can rule out intelligence uh, from, from this particular subject area. Um, and I could hear them saying that for pretty much everything that, um, you, know, that, that you can uh, call out in that way. I guess what how would you respond to to a scientist with with that attitude well if that was the attitude that attitude was correct we would understand scientific uh, psychic phenomena completely by this time but we don't one of the things that really amazed me when i started looking at life processes was was the number of questions everywhere i looked there were things that could not be explained in terms of a purely physical process um I'm trying to think of a fairly simple example here. Um, proteins are chains of amino acids. 
and they can be anywhere from 50 to, I think, probably several thousand amino acids uh, in length. And when a protein is being created, it just, there's this thing called a ribosome that strings these amino acids together. After it finishes, then the string folds up into a particular shape. And the shape is absolutely essential to its function. Um, if, if even one fold was different, then it wouldn't be able to function. It, it's a very specific, it's like a, it's folding up into a micro miniature machine. And I read somewhere that the number of possibilities for how, say, a 500 uh, amino acid chain could fold is probably more than the number of stars in the known universe. And yet, the protein folds up exactly the same way. It folds up you know, one single way. So how can it do that? Like you would have to posit in order to, to um, explain that in any way, shape or form, you have to bring in some kind of element which we don't know about right now. And then you would get to the question, well, why does this protein chain fold up differently from that one? So if you're talking about a rigid physical force like gravitation or electromagnetism or you know, nuclear forces, they would be blind. They only work in a very rigid, limited way. But here we have something which cannot be explained in terms of a rigid, uh, simple physical force. That There must be a more going on in that way than we know about. So I would say that if there weren't so many questions, that would be one thing. And uh, if some of these things could be explained in terms of a new physical force, yes, but they can't be. They're simply too complex. And um, here's another one. Um, this, to me, is the most amazing thing. Um, one aspect of they've known for you know for many years in genetics is that any individual can inherit any trait from any of their four grandparents. Now, the way DNA combines when when a, a, an egg and a, a sperm are coming together is that we get 23 single chromosomes from your mother and 23 from your father, and they pair up. And so that means that, let, let's take the situation, let's say a particular trait is associated with chromosome number seven. Now, let's say you got chromosome number seven from your mother, and she got chromosome number seven from her mother. How could you uh, inherit a trait from your mother's father? Because that chromosome came, or that, that particular one came from your mother's mother. So what happens is in the sex cells before they replicate, the chromosomes are actually matched up. So chromosome number seven from your mother and chromosome number seven from your father, they are literally sort of matched up. And they really don't know how this process happens, but they're sort of the, 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 like the chromosome is kind of like that four arms. It's like an X shape. So these chromosomes are matched up and then something goes down each of the four arms when, and, and looks at the gene sequences. And if it finds that the gene sequence on the mother's chromosome differs from that on the father's chromosome by more than a certain percentage, it calls in enzymes that snips out the gene from here, snips out the gene from there. They're swapped and stitched back in. Now, can this be explained in terms of a mechanical process? What's calculating the percentage different in the gene sequences? Um, I mean, we're talking about these micro miniatures, these proteins and enzymes. They're, they're little physical machines, but they're not like a laptop. They, they don't have like a central processing unit <laughs> that does what a laptop does. They're simply strings of proteins and amino acids that, that function in a certain way. So how is it possible to explain something here, that something is being calculated? How can that be a physical process? What's doing the calculation? And, and so uh, I would say that uh, to a scientist who is questioning my, my attitude, that if you can come up with a plausible explanation, which even remotely can explain how this happens, then I'll reconsider my position. But until then, you know, if you can't come up with one, then, <laughs> then you may have to look at what I'm saying seriously. 
So I just want to pause here just for a couple seconds and just uh, I know that we have folks viewing live. Um, if you have any questions for Michael Bradford, there's a chat window off to the side of the screen. If you just want to type in your questions there, um, we'll go ahead and answer them at the uh, at the tail end here. We've got about uh, 10 minutes or so left. But Mike, I wanted to jump into now we've talked about the scientific paradigm and this 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 new paradigm that uh, that is emerging that consciousness may be central to everything. Um, what role does Kundalini play in all of this? Uh, that's a really good question. And um, it's not an easy one to answer in you know 50 words or less. And in fact, in the book, I devote virtually an entire chapter to looking at the, uh, the, in, the cosmology of the Indian spiritual tradition uh, to show how this, this whole uh, understanding of consciousness and uh, the aspects of consciousness work. And uh, to put it as simply as I can, uh, reality in its ultimate form is unknowable. Uh, it's called Brahman, Brahman in, in uh, Sanskrit. It's not possible for us to know it. But because our minds think in dualistic terms, we think uh, we can understand it better if we think of it in terms of an infinite static consciousness and an all-powerful creative energy or, or creative power. And so um, this creative power, uh, there are different philosophical systems in India that, that will divide this creative power into different levels. And the Sankhya system has 24 levels. The, uh, um, uh, the Tantric system has 36 levels. And so what I tried to do was to boil it down into four sort of distinct uh, levels of manifestation. And uh, I, I don't really have time to go into too much detail on it, but the first couple of levels are how the physical creation is brought into being first through mind and then the senses and then matter. But after that, there are two elements of creation of this creative power left. One of them is prana shakti, which is the uh, maintenance of living forms, the maintenance of life forms. It's what runs our body from day to day. It keeps us living. It heals our bodies. Um, it is really uh, what controls every single process in the human body. And the fourth aspect is Kundalini Shakti, which is uh, evident in two different stages in our existence. Uh, the first stage at which Kundalini is, is highly active is in the womb, when we are a fetus and uh, the sperm and the egg have, uh, have uh, combined. And that is dividing and growing and, and uh, developing into a, a living, thinking, breathing human being. That process of construction in the womb is done by Kundalini Shakti. And I talked earlier in a, you know, in a discussion about how there is nothing in the genetic code that explains how that feat of construction actually takes place. It's Kundalini Shakti. And then when we're born, uh, Kundalini Shakti goes dormant uh, at the base of the spine. And then later in life, depending on our, our spiritual practices, our lifestyle, our heredity, uh, our diet, our occupation, a whole, many, many factors, uh, it may become active again in a more or less way. In some people, it becomes mildly active, in which case they be, may become a genius in some field of study or research. Or it may become active in a more physical way and the energy goes up the spine. And it tries to activate uh, like this new channel of perception in the brain. So these are the two areas of operation that Kundalini is, is active in. And there really is a third level or a third area of operation, and that's in the evolution of the species as a whole, where it is guiding and controlling human evolution from an overall standpoint. So that's really where Kundalini fits into the whole process. And uh, um, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I could spend hours talking about it, but if you're interested, then, uh, you know, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, you know, to read the book. So one question that we have from the audience um, is, does the Kundalini energy come from outside the body then? Is this something like, a, like an alien force kind of exerting itself on us, or, is, or do you understand it differently? It is, in a sense, coming from outside of the body because the way Gopi Krishna explained the process is that he said that every cell of the body is, um, he called them a little, a battery or a dynamo of chronic energy. 
And we intake prana into the body from the atmosphere. We breathe in, we, you know, pranayam, the control of prana. And he posited that perhaps prana is directly connected with oxygen in some way, because oxygen is the, the kind of like the, the catalyst for so many processes. So through pranayam, we are bringing in this pranic energy into the body. It's being stored in the cells of the body, in the muscles, in you know, the tissues, in the blood. And then he said, the nervous system in the body extracts a portion of this pranic energy from the cells and tissues of the body and brings it to the base of the spine. From that point, part of the energy goes to the reproductive system. And in a normal uh, state of consciousness, a very small part of that goes up the spinal cord in a transmuted form into the brain. Uh, he said it's transmuted into what he called a psychic fuel. Now, when Kundalini becomes active, it's actually working on the center in the brain, like the centers in the brain. So it's bringing out a new faculty of perception. So in order for this new faculty to function, it needs an increase in the flow of the psychic fuel. And so, um, you know, uh, it, it has to draw this initially from the, the reproductive system because it needs this energy right away and the body isn't used to providing it. Then over time, uh, as the body adjusts to the flow, uh, to extracting more and more energies from the tissues, then it is capable of providing the psychic fuel for the brain without the drain on the reproductive system. And this is why there has been very, very heavy emphasis in almost all spiritual traditions on conservation of the reproductive essences is because they are needed for uh, this process of evolution where these faculty, this new faculty of mind uh, is, is opening up in the brain and has to be powered by the psychic fuel in a much larger quantity and a much um, refined quantity as well. Like it's not just the quantity that is important, but it must be of a higher quality as well which is why there is so much emphasis in the discipline of yoga on purity, purity of body, purity of mind. Everything is purity. You know, you have to provide the brain with this enhanced flow of very pure psychic fuel. And so uh, to answer that question, yes, uh, it is coming from outside in a way. And in his autobiography, Gopi Krishna talked about you know, prana, streams of prana coming from the moon, from the planets, from the stars. Uh, the earth is a store of prana. There's all these different uh, types of uh, prana in creation. And um, it's, it's uh, again, it, it's, it's an intelligent energy. It's, it's beyond our conception to even remotely conceive of it. So, uh, again, you know, that's, um, you know, the research has a long way to go before we understand all these things. So just a couple quick points. Um, we've only got a couple minutes left. But one thing that we didn't get to touch on today was... Um, the the goal of this kundalini process, which you which you earlier called a predetermined target, uh, which is higher consciousness or enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Did you want to say a, a few words on kind of that that end state and how it relates to this entire kind of subject? Um. Yeah. Uh, I guess to me one of the most important things uh, about. Um, this whole subject is to recognize the predetermined nature of this goal and evolution. That is really uh, the key to um, really to understanding what's going on. And, you know, I mean, the Darwinian attitude towards evolution is, well, it's blind random chance. But according to, you know, uh, what Gopi Krishna has said, and really from a logical perspective, um, this evolution to the new state of consciousness is really uh, the whole point of, of the whole Kundalini process. And it's trying to get us there in whatever way it can. And the way that it can work in different individuals varies because we each have different physical constitutions, different mental constitutions. And so, you know, our, our bodies each have a different capacity for how far we can go in this process. And, and so it, it's a very difficult process to understand because of that, that uh, first of all, because of so many ways that it can manifest. If you look at um, like in the, the list of possible Kundalini, uh, the things that can happen to a person with a Kundalini awakening, it's huge. Uh, but also uh, because of the fact that we're dealing with an intelligent energy 
it makes it much more complicated uh, to really understand it. But um, in sense of uh, the goal of evolution, um, Gopi Krishna emphasized time and time and time and time and time again that if we don't cooperate with this process, then the result is, in the old days, it would be simply wars, revolutions, uh, upheavals. In the modern society, we've got nuclear weapons by the tens of thousands. And it's possible that the human race, you know, if we had, say, some uh, mad dictator comes to power, and uh, driven by a Kundalini, which provides charisma, that, you know, it could be the end of our species as a consequence. So we really have to look at um, the whole, ad, uh, this whole aspect of evolution in the sense that how do our, all of our social systems affect this process? How does education affect it? How do our political systems affect it? How do our educational systems affect it? And we have to go out and look at modifying all of those different systems uh, to cooperate with this process. And, you know, there's a tendency to, you know, in human nature to say, well, you know, uh, let the government do it. You know, uh, you know, what part can I play? I'm just a single individual. But in fact, uh, to me, what's absolutely essential is that every individual uh, be willing to honestly look at their own paradigm, their own assumptions, their own beliefs, uh, look at what they're doing in their life and uh, be willing to undertake this this process, this spiritual journey, you might call it, uh, to enhance their own consciousness. And it's up to each of us as individuals uh, to have that discernment. Uh, in, in, in the Vedic systems, it was called uh, viveka, intellectual or discerning discrimination to recognize what is real uh, as opposed to what is not real. And it is up to each and every one of us to, in our own way, uh, to go down that path where we try and increase our discrimination and uh, through the process of self-examination uh, to look at why we do what we do and, and how, as individuals, can we contribute to making the evolutionary process that's working in the race uh, work better. And, you know, there's so many ways to do that in terms of preserving the environment, uh, in terms of spiritual practice, in terms of helping other people, in terms of reforming our political systems. There's just so many ways that that can be done. Yeah, just as a follow-up question to the, um, the earlier question about where Kundalini energy comes from, uh, the follow-up question here is, uh, then what now what do we do with the energy? Do we focus on it? Put our intention on it, uh, open us up ourselves up to visions, um, and if it's a new faculty, then where is it going? That's a, diff a difficult question to answer in some ways because, uh, as I said a, a few minutes ago, uh, everybody is different, and everybody has a certain potential to manifest Kundalini to, you know, to a more or less degree. And um, what I would say is that it's really incumbent on uh, each one of us to learn more about Kundalini, to proceed like in, the, in your own inner exploration to the point that the energy can take you in with your current physical body. So, you know, it's a matter of becoming more aware of yourself and looking at what can I do to enhance this process? How can I change my lifestyle? How can I change my diet? How can I change my spiritual practices? And say, if you look at the discipline of, of Ashtanga Yoga, uh, Ashtanga Yoga, the eight limbs of yoga, that's uh, to me one of the best ways, you know, to look at all the various aspects of the discipline, uh, the modifications to behavior, you know, the, the golden rules, um, you know, the attention to purity of the body. So, uh, in terms of where it's going to go in an individual, that's to a, a certain degree dependent on the individual, but uh, for the individual, you each individual must, in their own way, discover what their creative potential is. And in a general sense, what Kundalini is trying to do is to enhance our creativity, to bring about these new mental faculties where, <coughs> excuse me, where we can perceive consciousness in a more direct way. 
And it's important to keep that goal in mind that this is what it's trying to accomplish. And to whatever degree that we can cooperate with the process, uh, then it will proceed, you know, uh, more smoothly and in a more harmonious way and bring us more positive and rewarding results as a consequence of that. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, one suggestion here that a couple people had was they really enjoyed the book, but uh, people actually wanted to hear more of your your own opinions and your own conclusions on uh, all of the material that you presented. There was a lot of, uh, you know, people acknowledge that there was a lot of research and work that went into consolidating all this stuff into, a, you know, a very informative and thought provoking way. But uh, I think maybe as a, an idea for a, a, a second book, maybe, you know, talking more about uh, where you think this is all going and kind of your own, your own conclusions and, and opinions about the future direction of science and where, where this is all leading us. Well, as far as my own uh, plans, I, I this book really came about just uh, to me. I, I didn't sort of sit down and want to say I want to write a book. It just kind of evolved into that, and I found that that as I got into it, uh, more and more things started to come to my attention. Uh, more and more things started to interest me. Uh, even like people would phone me up and say, oh, hey, have you heard about this person on YouTube? They're talking about something you like to talk about. And it just kind of happened. And um, at the moment, I don't have any kind of personal uh, plan for writing about anything else. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And uh, I guess in a way, I kind of look at it as something beyond uh, my own self that, that urged me to do it. It's something that um, just gave me hints and nudges and, you know, come on, get out there and do it, you know, <laughs> put things in front of me. And um, I found that once I got into doing the research, ideas would just start coming into my head. And uh, uh, for me personally, I, I like doing long distance cycling. And I found that when I would go out on these long three, four, five, six hour bike rides, all these ideas would just start flowing into my mind. And then, you know, unfortunately, I couldn't write some of them down. <laughs> I get to the end of my bike ride. Oh, I didn't write that down. Oh, I've forgotten what. <laughs> but it was a very personal process for me. And uh, um, I guess in terms of the research, uh, you know, I, I have devoted you know, 40 some odd years of my life uh, to the publication of Gopi Krishna's uh, writings, his talks, his, uh, his interviews, his books. And for me, that's um, kind of like the, the way that I uh, see myself continuing on uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in a general way is uh, we're trying to get all of Gopi Krishna's books published as audio books now, although we've been having difficulty in finding uh, a reader who is uh, sort of an English speaking first language with Sanskrit knowledge. So if anyone knows anyone of that, uh, uh, you know, who fits into that category, please let me know. But that is generally where, uh, you know, I'm going to continue on with my efforts and my energies. And if another book, uh, if uh, it comes to me, it comes to me. And uh, I hope that it does, but we'll see. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Again, the book is Consciousness, The New Paradigm by Michael Bradford. Um, it's a great book. I highly recommend that if you have an interest in understanding uh, science a little bit better and where it intersects with uh, the science of Kundalini, uh, you pick up the book on Amazon.com. Uh, you can buy it there. Mike, I think Amazon is the place to, to get the book. Yes, you can get either the ebook or the printed book. All right. And thank you to our, our audience today uh, for your questions and uh, for your presence. Uh, wishing everybody the best and safe journeys. Bye-bye.